Hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Ben Feinstein. I'm the Director of Operations and Analysis for the Dell SecureWorks Counter Threat Unit. Uh, to my left is my colleague, Jeff Jarmok. Yeah, hi. If we could get his mic hot as well. Okay. Can we get that mic on? Um, so I'm Jeff Jarmok. I'm a, a security researcher with the Dell SecureWorks Counter Threat Unit. So today we'll be uh, giving a talk we call Get Off of My Cloud. Um, just to start with a little thought or a pictograph, if you will, this is one conception of multi-tenancy in the cloud, sort of a uh, crazy bazaar of different customers um, all sitting next to each other on the same uh, shared infrastructure. This is one way you can conceive of that. So what are we going to be talking about today? Well, uh, when we set out to start this work some months ago, we wanted to first understand um, more about Amazon's cloud platform. We didn't set out to do this to pick on Amazon by any chance, but really they're, they're the uh, big gorilla in the room when it comes to public clouds and infrastructure as a service clouds. So if you're going to be doing research as it relates to public cloud and, and infrastructure cloud, really Amazon is, is the biggest uh, player right now. So we wanted to understand all the different uh, types of credentials that you use when you're using Amazon's web services. We really wanted to understand sort of the order of precedence of all those different credentials. So if you were to have one type of credential, what could you do with it and what other types of credentials could you control or uh, manipulate? Um, also understanding common mistakes and pitfalls uh, of people or organizations that are using Amazon's cloud services. So part of this is looking at best practices and the guidance that's published, but also um, understanding what are some really easy ways to make some bad mistakes out there. And then with that in mind, we uh, set off to develop a set of tools to detect um, instances of, of these problems, basically uh, cases where credentials could be exposed uh, within Amazon's virtual machine images, uh, or rather virtual machine images that are published uh, within Amazon's cloud by third parties. Um, and also these tools would detect malicious images uh, or backdoored uh, images that could be out there in the public, uh, the public set of images. Also, we performed an experiment to better quantify the scale of potential victims. If you were to release a malicious machine image, and we'll define some of these terms, so I apologize if this is some terminology up front, but if you were to release a malicious virtual machine image uh, and publish it in Amazon's cloud, uh, we did an experiment to get a sense of how many victims you could, uh, you could count on receiving and how many of those victims you might actually be able to take control of their, their virtual machine. And also throughout this work, uh, we maintained uh, our work was consistent with our reading of Amazon Web Services customer agreement and their terms of service that are published on their website. So um, people are, you know, organizations are moving all their infrastructure into the cloud at a rapid pace. Um, there's a number of reasons why they're doing that, but really it's, it's, you shouldn't fear the cloud or you shouldn't blindly embrace the cloud. It's really just a tool. Um, like any other tool, there's good uses, there's bad uses, and there's really suicidal uses. So you can think of it sort of like a knife. You know, there's obviously some good uses for knives here. Um, in this case, Crocodile Dundee, he has a knife. There's lower costs in the cloud. There's decreased time to market, which is very attractive uh, for organizations today. You can rapidly scale out your infrastructure without having to purchase data centers and hardware and servers and storage. And also, uh, you could inexpensively uh, get geographically diverse infrastructure uh, by using cloud services such as Amazon's. So there's obviously some bad uses for the cloud, just like bad uses for a knife. Uh, there's relative anonymity to be found. Um, basically, you can uh, spin up instances in different regions of the world. Uh, it's very difficult for a third party to determine who's the actual actor that's behind that virtual machine image or behind that IP address that's sitting in Amazon's cloud. Um, it's it's uh, inexpensive, or if you perhaps have stolen credit cards or you've stolen credentials to other cloud users, it's free. Um, it's very hard for defenders to blacklist cloud infrastructure. Um, the IP addresses are ephemeral. They change rapidly. Um, you're going you're gonna to do a tremendous impact to your business if you just blacklist like, large swaths of Amazon's cloud because there's a lot of legitimate uses and legitimate services that are running there. Um, it makes geo, geo IP address blocking or geographical blocking much more difficult because you can just spin up a virtual instance in any number of places around the globe um, to kind of hide where, where the actual location of the, the attacker is. And again, it's highly scalable. That plays for both good and bad. If a, if a malicious party wishes to have a highly scalable infrastructure to support cybercrime or, or some other aspect, well, the cloud will offer that as well. You can, you can find uh, any number of press reports about, you know, spammers using uh, cloud services, 
Um, even malware is now starting to uh, attack cloud services. There was a case of a spy eye trojan that had been modified uh, to access Amazon S3 and, and uh, uh, compromise some buckets in that. And what we're really talking about also is the suicidal uses of the cloud here. Inadvertently, we found that many uh, many publishers of third-party images, but also many uh, users of the cloud that are using third-party images are putting themselves at great risk. So don't be this guy. You need to, uh, you know, look at the cloud, and but do it with open eyes and do it, you know, by considering the risks and looking at the best practices and making sure that you're really adhering to the published guidance out there so that you can use these cloud services but use it in a safe way and, and take, take uh, assessment of the risk. Uh, so some terminology, I apologize for those of you that are already, this is already old hat to you, but um, when we gave some dry runs of this, many, many folks weren't uh, really intimately familiar with Amazon's web services yet, and there's a whole lot of acronyms out there that we'll be using. So AWS, that's Amazon Web Services, that's sort of the overarching uh, suite of different services that they offer um, for their cloud service delivery. Uh, EC2, you'll hear us use that term. That's their Elastic Compute Cloud. It's essentially an uh, infrastructure as a service. Um, you can get shared compute storage and network through the EC2. An AMI, or uh, AMI, I've heard it called as well, is Amazon Machine Image. It's essentially, uh, what it is, it's a virtual appliance container format. So you would pick an Amazon Machine Image and you could launch any number of instances of that image uh, and those actually become virtual machines that would be running in the EC2 cloud. S3, or Simple Storage Service. Uh, that's object storage that Amazon offers its customers. Um, it, you basically uh, use what's known as buckets, and you read and write data into those buckets as objects. And then a, a, a more, uh, more recent addition, though it's, it's probably been out for a few years now, is the Elastic Block Store. And that is a, it's a virtualized block device. Just like on a Unix or Linux system, you can mount a block device on that system and read and write to it, just like a file system. EBS is a cloud file system, a cloud block device that you can uh, mount on your images there. So when we first set out to do this project, we wanted to understand all the different kinds of credentials out there um, and what, their different, what the different uses of those credentials are and then which ones control which other credentials. So there's really three broad categories of credentials for Amazon Web Services. There's access credentials, there's sign-in credentials, and then there's a set of different account identifiers that you have to use. Um, in terms of access credentials, you've got access keys. An access key is merely a, a long, unique string of uh, digits. There's a public and a secret part of that. Um, it's a little bit analogous to certificates, but there are certificates in play as well. We'll talk about those. But your access key ID also has a secret access key. And what you use that for are uh, authenticated uh, web services APIs, like SOAP APIs to use um, simple storage service, or Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, which is essentially a, a, a service where you can get real human beings to do your bidding for, uh, for pennies per request. Uh, there's a screenshot on the next slide where basically you manage all these different credentials within Amazon's uh, web console. And uh, these keys are also, the access keys are also used for CloudFront, which is Amazon's own content distribution network that they offer as part of their web services suite. Amazon's recommendation here, rotate those keys at least every 90 days. Here's a quick screenshot of the Nifty web interface where you can, uh, you can manage these access keys, um, both the secret key and the um, uh, private public key part of it. Another important um, credential is X509 certificates. So many parts of Amazon Web Services, you use a uh, certificate and private key to access or to sign your images, to bundle images. Um, these are, again, they're managed through Amazon's Web Services console, but you also can do some of this with APIs. You can generate your own uh, certificate or private key, or you can provide your own certificate. This is sort of a trade-off of convenience versus security. Um, either you let Amazon generate the secret key for you, or you do that on a system. Uh, you know, it's obviously recommended that you probably want to generate your secret key yourself and then provide uh, up to Amazon. Use it to bundle your AMIs. It cryptographically signs and encrypts uh, AMIs that are private or just cryptographically signs the machine images that you're going to make public. Again, Amazon's recommendation, rotate these things every, every 90 days. So go issue new certificate and private key at least every 90 days for your infrastructure. Another, web, uh, another screenshot here. EC2 key pairs. Um, this, is a, this is one of the biggest findings that we'll get into later uh, of what we actually found when we scanned the US East cloud. 
with our tools that we're, that we're releasing today. They're SSH key pairs for all intensive purposes. Um, when you spin up, when you, when you launch an instance of a machine image, you specify an SSH key pair for that image to load. And on boot up, it essentially loads the private, excuse me, loads the public key into the SSH authorized key file, and then you use your private key to access it to SSH and get a console on that virtual machine. So it's a very convenient way um, to, to get, ac get secure access to a virtual machine. You don't need to bake um, an authorized key file into the image itself, you specify it at runtime when you spin up a virtual machine. There's no explicit security recommendations I've found uh, from Amazon around these key pairs or rotating them uh, or such. And there's also, interestingly, uh, there's Windows virtual machines that you could run in the EC2, and these key pairs play a role there where literally the administrative RDP or remote desktop password is encrypted uh, with the private key, and you would decrypt it um, and then access the RDP port on the Windows image. So it plays a role in accessing Windows uh, images as well. And you can log into the web console and play with these things and allocate your keys and such. Um, CloudFront key pairs, uh, yet another set of credentials. What we found is there's, there's so many different, you know, access keys, private keys, key pairs, uh, cloud front key pairs that it's, it's quite confusing and really the first part of our research was just figuring out and identifying and enum enumerating all the different credentials that you have to use when you use Amazon's web services. This is the key you use when you're using their CDN network um, to generate signed URLs. Essentially a way of offering private, uh, private content within Amazon's content distribution network. So pretty much the, the one key to rule them all is the sign-in credential. This is the actual login that you log into their administrative web interface and control all aspects of your Amazon Web Services account. So this is, if you're gonna defend any of these and, and secure them um, strongly, this is probably the most important set of credentials there are. What it is, if you've, if you've ever bought a book from Amazon or a CD, it's your username and password. All you do is take a normal Amazon account, you may have purchased a book, and you activate web services on that account. And that is now, that your login to Amazon's web service is now the credential, uh, website is now the credential to your web services account. They've just uh, also offered multi-factor authentication. It's not RSA Secure ID. Um, so you can protect this with multi-factor auth. You go purchase a $12 or $13 uh, token online. You uh, activate your account with this token, and then now you've got multi-factor authentication uh, to uh, add to just the username and password to protect this. This is really important for enterprises or larger organizations that are going to be using cloud services so that you're not, your whole kingdom isn't just relying on one username and password here. And they haven't rolled out the uh, kit and retinal scan just yet. Account identifiers, there's, there's um, uh, two 